afternoon and welcome to Curious About the Human Body, brought to you by Glasgow Science Centre. Our session, session today is a live Q&A with Professor Jason Leach, Scotland's National Clinical Director. So the National Clinical Director is responsible for quality in the health and social care system. Professor Jason Leach has spoken at a number of public engagement events, including official updates and press conferences, media interviews, and online live Q&As to convey essential information about coronavirus and public safety measures to the public. Today, he is here to answer your questions about coronavirus and public health. So without any further ado, I do welcome Professor Jason Leach. Welcome, how are you today? I'm well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Um, I wanted to firstly start by saying that the past two years for you have probably been the busiest of your career yet. Um, so I wanted to firstly ask, how are you? Uh, and, and secondly ask uh, if you can tell us what it's been like to coordinate a response to the coronavirus pandemic uh, and ensure that uh, public information or safety information has been uh, disseminated into the public appropriately? Well, it hasn't been quiet, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, it, it reminds me, the only time I've worked this hard is when I was a very junior surgeon a long time ago when we worked very long hours uh, in yeah. hospitals. But I'm a lot older now and not quite as energetic, so it does it does feel intense. But, uh, but before I answer the bulk of your question, I should put that in perspective. There are many people in the country who have worked harder than me. People in our care homes, people in our intensive care units, people in our general practices, and people in our supermarkets and electricity supplies. So the, the whole country has had to respond to this pandemic. It's not just been a public health problem. It's been a challenge for everybody from schools to museums to electricity to everything else but but my job has been intense I, I never thought I would be in a room every single day with the first minister of my country trying to give the best advice I could uh, not always going down entirely well because some of the advice has had to be quite difficult to give mm -hmm. both to her and to the public it has been interesting though to have purpose to have something to do. I think the only thing worse for me than doing this job would have been not having something to do during the pandemic. I have I have felt that I've been able to contribute. You can argue later whether that's been a good contribution or not, but that, that's not up to me. I've tried my best. I, I'm tired, if I'm <laughs> honest. I'm tired, as is everybody else after two years. I think you are more than allowed to feel tired, I think I would be as well. I know uh, a lot of um, staff here, we've worked really hard to, we had some GSE at home videos and um, I, I completely understand. I think a lot of the staff here at the Glasgow Science Centre really enjoyed uh, being able to come in every day and have something to do. So I, I think we can really empathise with that. Um, and also just to touch on your point, how it very much has been a community effort. You recognised uh, the healthcare workers uh, and supermarket staff as well. And so I think it really has been such an interesting two years where we've really had to band together um, and it hasn't just been sort of one or two people. It really has been a huge team effort. Um, I, one of my, my sister is actually an ICU nurse uh, back home in Australia. And so it's um, absolutely incredible to see the amount of work that they've put in completely. Tell her there's a job for here whenever, there's a job for her whenever she needs it. <laughs> I'll make sure I pass that along to her. Um, but you are here today to answer some uh, questions that the public uh, have around coronavirus and public health. So I do want to jump straight into those. Um, and so our first question for today is from St. Rose of Lima, P5. Uh, and they have asked, why does the COVID vaccine make you unwell? It's a, good, it's a great question. Let, let's remember... It only makes you unwell temporarily. And if you're fortunate, it doesn't make you feel anything at all. It, and, and COVID is much worse. So having said that, then let's think about the science around the vaccine. So vaccines have existed for 150 years, and they all basically do the same thing. You take a little piece of the infectious agent, 
So that could be a bacteria, it could be a virus. And you, in the laboratory, you put that little tiny piece, not the whole thing. Remember, the virus looks like a football with spikes, like mm -hmm. the cartoons you've seen of it. That's actually what it looks like down the microscope. It's a football with spikes. And we take a little piece of the spike and we put it in a solution and we trick your body into thinking we've given you the virus. So we inject you, sorry, we inject you with that little piece of the virus. But it's not the whole virus. And the, the virus can't do anything unless it's the whole football and all the spikes. Your body then makes a reaction to that. It makes what we call antibodies. And those antibodies, if you think of them like soldiers waiting behind a wall, mm -hmm. so they're not doing anything, they're just waiting. And when the real virus comes, they're ready. They're already there and they're ready to fight the actual virus. Now, the problem is that when you make the antibodies, that can make you feel a bit dodgy for a couple of days. It cannot give you the disease. So it's actually your body making the antibodies that makes you feel a bit weird. And the worst people get a couple of days of feeling a bit as though they've got the cold. So you might get a runny nose, you might get a headache, you might, some people get a little bit of a sore throat. And then the only other side effect really is some people get a sore arm. And that's just the trauma of giving you the injection. So it's into muscle. So sometimes that muscle just reacts a little bit. It, it's neither here nor there. It always goes away and nobody's left with anything permanent. So that's why when we give you those trick bits of the virus, to trick you into thinking we've given you the virus, you sometimes feel a little bit ropey for a couple of days. Exactly. It, it just helps our body prepare for when the the real thing uh, comes, if, if and when it does come. Absolutely. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, we have another question coming up, uh, and it says, do antibiotics treat coronavirus? Why or why not? They do not. No. So... There are three types, principal types, mm. of infection you can get. You can get a bacteria, you can get a virus, or you can get a fungus. So let's forget about the fungus. We'll do them another day. So bacteria are alive, actually yeah. alive. They've got all of the ingredients you need to be an organism, something mm. that can function and divide and becomes, become bigger and all of those things. And you've got loads of them in your gut, on your skin, they're the things that might cause you to have a salmonella if you eat bad chicken. Mm -hmm. So that would be a bacteria. Or they might cause you to have a skin infection. If you, if you had a wound in your skin and it got infected, that would be a bacteria. Or it might give you a chest infection. Some people get pneumonia. That would be a chest infection. And since we invented or discovered penicillin, we've had mm -hmm. the ability to fight bacteria with antibiotics they attach themselves to the bacteria and they kill it. That's how it works. Because those actual bacteria are alive. Unfortunately, viruses are not alive. Viruses are very, very clever. Viruses are just a balloon full of genetic material. So DNA. Remember, we're all made of DNA. Mm -hmm. And the only thing a virus has is a balloon wall and DNA in the middle. That's it. That's all they have. They have no brain. They have no way of dividing. They have no fat, nothing. So all they want to do is find a cell in your body to get inside it and use the machinery that's in your human cells to do all that work for them. Mm -hmm. So I don't like to say they're clever because it, it, it sounds as though I'm giving them a brain. They don't have brains, but they are smart. So antibiotics don't have anywhere to attach to. So they mm -hmm. do not work for viruses. Sometimes they work for the bacteria that you get because you're sick and because the virus has made you ill, you might have bacteria on top of it. But that's why you hear every winter when people come to the doctor with the cold, which is a viral disease, or with the flu, we say, we're not going to give you antibiotics. They're not going to help you. They do not work for viruses. It's unfortunate but they just do not work. Absolutely. And it's because bacteria and viruses, two very completely different things as well. Um, that's absolutely amazing. Uh, I was going to ask to, now that we're, we're 
you did mention that viruses don't have a brain and so you can say that they're very smart but they've not got like they are smart um, but they've not got a brain so they're not a living thing uh, and so my question just to to touch on the end of that is how how are they then a how are there different variants? Like how are we able to get those different variants? Because quite often uh, you do hear about how um, viruses, you know, they want to make sure that they can survive in, in their host and, and jump from one host to the next. Um, but they don't obviously have a brain, so it's not like they're consciously thinking, oh, do you know what? I think I need to do this or I need to not be as, as, um, as harsh because I want to make sure I survive. So how do they, uh, how do they adjust or evolve uh, in order to change into these different variants? So remember we said it's a balloon with DNA in the middle. So if there were a virus on this, I'm, I'm at a glass desk. If there was a virus on this glass, it wouldn't last very long. they just die. But if the virus is in me, because it can get inside my cells, it can last a long time because it can survive. And what it does is it uses that DNA that it's got to make copies of itself. It's mm -hmm. a bit weird, but it just makes repeat copies of itself. Now, it doesn't do that once. It does it hundreds of millions of times. So you start with a little bit of virus and you end up with a lot of virus. Now, mm -hmm. randomly... When it duplicates itself, it makes mistakes because the DNA is just a long, thin line, microscopic, can't, can't even see it down a microscope, a long, thin line of chemicals. And as it reproduces itself, mistakes happen. So a bit falls off or a bit gets added on. And all of that mixes together and you end up with a different virus. It's not entirely different because it's still got the basics the same, but inside that virus, there might just be a little bit of chemical difference. Now, if you are trying to win the race, if you're a virus, the only thing you want to do is find a new host. That's the only thing you care about. You want to find a new person or a new animal, whichever virus you are, in order to do that replicating thing again. Because if you've given it to me and I'm all, I'm all done, if I've got all the virus I can take, you now need to move to another person and do all that again. It doesn't actually care if it kills you or makes you sick or any of those things. It doesn't, it doesn't know. What it needs is another human being to do the replicating again. Mm -hmm. So the one that escapes is usually the one that wins the race. And therefore, if you've got, let's say we've done all that division and we've now got 10 new versions of the virus out of the 100 million. So there's 10 new versions. The one that goes to you, if you and I shake hands at the science center one morning, is the one that's the best at moving across. It's really, really fast evolution because it's the survival of the fittest version of the virus. And it will go to the next person and it will do the same thing again. And every so often, one of them becomes globally, right across the whole world, better at doing that than its cousin that came before. And that's how we've ended up with COVID-19 viruses called Alpha, Gamma, Delta, and Omicron, we've had four versions of the same COVID-19 virus, and each one has been better at the duplicating thing and the transmitting thing than its brother or sister or grandfather, whatever you want to call the one that came before. I really love the analogy that you used, that it's very much like a race and whoever gets to that sort of crosses the line first wins. Um, I think it's a fantastic way to explain it. Um, we are. We have got another question coming up, uh, and it is, how do masks help stop the spread of coronavirus? So this is. It's really, really straightforward. But but it it's not great science. It 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 just stops you coughing and spluttering and sniffing all over your pals. So the virus the virus needs to be contained within something, and yep. it's contained within droplets, and those droplets are usually saliva and snot from your nose. So that's where the virus is. It's disgusting, but that's where the virus is. I hope nobody's eating their lunch uh, right now, but that, that's Hopefully where the not. virus is. So if you can, if you can control those droplets, mm. now remember, this is, it's not all off or all on. Viruses and public health don't work like that. If you wanted to stop the virus completely, you'd have to put everybody in their houses, lock all the doors, send everybody food parcels every week, and not let anybody out forever. So you can't, you can't do that. 
So everything that you do is about just reducing the amount of virus that's in the air and in the on my desk and in me and all of that. So one of the ways we do that is face coverings. Now, face coverings stop those droplets somewhat. They don't stop them completely, but they stop them better than no face covering. And if you've got it over your mouth and your nose together, that works better. And if they're good face coverings, it works better. And if you wear them in crowded areas, it works better. So it's just a physical block to stop, if you've got it, to stop that virus going into the air. If I walked into a room of 100 people today, it's very likely that five of those people will have the virus in Scotland today because we've got about that number of people who are infected. And most of those people won't know they have it. So I am safer in that room if they are wearing face coverings. And I can make them safer if I wear a face covering. So we don't need to wear them outdoors. We don't need to wear them if we're by ourselves. We don't even need to wear them if we're with our families because we're, we're with them all the time. Mm. But if we're in a crowded area like a subway or a train or a bus or going to a concert or something like that, and that's why we did it in schools because schools were quite, when we had high numbers, schools were very, very good at transmitting it from person to person. And that's why you still need them in some areas in schools and not in others. Absolutely. I think, do you know what? Sometimes the science doesn't need to be complicated. Sometimes the science can be very, very simple. And I think with the case of mask wearing, it is quite literally just a physical barrier and it helps reduce the amount of, as you say, droplets or viral droplets that uh, go out into the atmosphere um, and reduces the chance of infection. So thank you. Um, I think we've got another question coming up uh, and that is, oh, this one's a good one. What is the difference between a lateral flow test and a piece PCR test? Well, they do slightly different things. Mm -hmm. the, the PCR test, which is, here's the technical bit, the polymerase chain reaction test mm -hmm. is a well-known method for finding virus. Okay. So it can find remnants. Remember the bubble in the DNA? So it yep. can find the actual DNA of the virus. So, but you can't do it in your house. It needs a machine about the size of your house in order to work itself out because it's very, very expensive and very mm -hmm. complex science. Actually, the human element is easy. You just put the sample in a little cartridge and you put it in the machine and the machine does its thing. But even in the fastest machines we have, all of that science can take a couple of hours. So mm -hmm. it's, it's quite a complicated thing. But what it does is it looks for the genetic material of the virus. And if it finds it, it knows you're positive. So the definitive test, the correct test to really know if you've got COVID-19 is the PCR test. It is very rarely wrong. Now, the lateral flow test is genius, absolute genius. It's amazing. Because, because now when you brush your teeth, you can do a home test for the virus. Now, what it's doing is it's trying to do the same thing. It's trying to find the, the virus but it gets a little bit mixed up. It's not quite as good at it as the polymerase version. So it yeah. uses proxies. It uses estimates of what it can look for. It's still looking for the bubble in the genetic material, but it's just not quite as good at it or as accurate as the PCR test. And it works really well in people who are very infectious because you need more of the virus for it to prove you're positive or not. So it doesn't find maybe positives quite as well as the PCR test does. But when you do it across the whole population, it really helps us. It helps us protect people from, what's, from, from what is a really nasty disease in some people. So those little lateral flow tests that you're fed up doing with the swabs up your nose are really, really useful because they've helped us stop a lot of positives. We, 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 think, we think we've maybe, so for instance, at COP26, we mm -hmm. had 27,000 people in the SECC and everybody had to do a lateral flow test before they arrived and 360 people were positive. So we had wow. 360 people who were outside testing and they didn't go inside because we found them. And that's really useful because those 360 people could potentially have passed it on to 30 people each or 100 people each and we'd have soon had big outbreaks. And that's why we've done them in schools 
teachers and staff and pupils have been helping us to do them uh, when we've had a really difficult, difficult period over the last two years. Absolutely. I think it, it, it's enabled us to get back to some form of normality, especially the lateral flows, because I know I certainly, every time I, I go out to something now, I make sure I do my lateral flow test and uh, make sure it's nice and negative. And I think it, it just, it, it gives you that feeling that you're able to, um, that you're doing the right thing and that you can identify if, uh, yep. if you do, if you are positive or not, it's quite good. Um, I think we've got another question coming up and that is, why can people still catch coronavirus if they've had the vaccine? Yeah, well, remember what we said the vaccine does. The vaccine creates soldiers to fight the virus. It doesn't stop you catching it. But it means when you catch it, you can fight it off. And you can fight it off much, much better than you would if it was the first time you had met it and you had no antibodies. So antibodies can be, create, can be created with by two Roots. They can be created by having the disease, but you've probably been very sick from the disease, or they can be created by us giving you the vaccine, but they don't stop you catching it. What they do, though, is if you think of the droplets and the snot and the coughing all over everybody, if everybody has milder disease across the population, then there are less droplets. It just makes sense. So you're coughing and spluttering less, less people have the disease. So therefore, the vaccine does reduce over time the amount of virus that's around in a population. But the virus is clever and the virus is trying to find a way through all the time to try and find people who are unvaccinated or vaccinated a long time ago. Or So we need to keep on top of it all the time. But nobody ever said the vaccine would stop you getting the, getting the virus. What we've always said is the vaccine will stop you getting sick from the virus. And that's a completely different thing. And vaccines are not like vaccines are not like light switches. They're more like a dimmer switch on your lights. If you're posh, you might have a switch that you can turn your lights down and up, not just on and off. So on and off doesn't work for immunity. What happens is you get a dial that might take you up to 10, which would protect you completely. But at, over time, that dimmer switch just comes down and your antibodies become less effective. So you might be a seven today. So if you met somebody, you might have a chance of catching it, not being so sick. When you get another va vaccine, back up to 10 again. So, so it, it, it changes over time. And the dimmer switch is how you should think of your immunity. And if you're due for your vaccine, because we've just opened it up to 5 to 11-year-olds, so they'll be getting letters soon. So we can talk to mums and dads and carers and young people about them getting their vaccine, hopefully in the next few months. Perfect. And I was just going to, you were talking about the dimmer and how it can go from 10 down to seven. Is that why we have booster vaccines as well? And it, is it shown that our antibodies slowly go down and that booster vaccine just helps? Correct. It's, it's, even, it's even better news than that. So first vaccine takes you from zero to, let's say, zero to six. And then we go up from six to 10 with the next one. And as it comes down, the booster might take you to 12. So, so it, 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 it keeps you up higher. It doesn't yeah. go right back to the bottom again. It's not we're having to do the same thing every time. Each one you get just helps a little bit more. Now, we haven't had this disease for very long. So we don't know what the long-term vaccination mm -hmm. will have to be. We think probably we'll have to vaccinate adults once a year. But we yeah. don't know for sure what that will look like. We've just said we're going to vaccinate young people and we're going to vaccinate all the over 75s again now. And then I think in the autumn, so after the summer, I think we'll probably be doing all adults again before we get to the winter. Absolutely. That makes sense. Absolute sense. I think we've got about two more questions before it's unfortunately time to say goodbye. So we've got one coming up that says, what other public health issues are you concerned about at the moment? So obviously, coronavirus has, has taken a lot of our attention over the past year, but are there any other public health issues that uh, you need to or are concerning you or that you have to have a bit of brain space for at the moment? What a great question. Yes. So it's important. It we often think COVID-19 is the only the only game in town. It's not. Nothing else has gone away. We didn't we didn't replace all the other things in society with COVID. We've got 
COVID and everything else. So, so the biggest problem in Scotland from a health perspective is inequality. The fact that we have an unfair society where some people will be healthier for longer than others. Now, that's a really complex discussion that we maybe need to do another day. But fundamentally, that's about poverty. So public health is about poverty. It's about good houses. It's about good jobs. It's about good education. It's about somewhere to ride your bike. It's about fruit and vegetables. It's about healthy eating and exercise, all of that. So inequality in the round is probably the biggest public health challenge of our generation. And we've been working even during COVID on trying to fix some of that because COVID is worse if you're poor. Mm -hmm. So COVID is harder to recover from if you don't have a job that will pay you for being off or you find self-isolation difficult or you find it difficult to get the tests or you don't have access because you don't speak English as your first language or what, whatever it might be. So those things make recovery from COVID and other diseases much more difficult. So the single public health challenge that Scotland still faces is inequality. Um, have you found that the coronavirus pandemic has has widened that inequality at all or reduced it? It's it's made it worse. So yeah. it has it has what we would say exposed it. So like all infectious disease, we all knew this that it, infectious disease is harder if you're poorer, hmm. and that makes sense. If you if you can take time off work and nobody takes your wage off you, or if you've got the ability to pay for childcare or pay for your shopping to be delivered or pay for Amazon parcels, then it, it, exactly. it's you could still have a horrible time from COVID, but everything else is slightly easier than it would have been. So it has made that inequality challenge in Scotland, I'm afraid, slightly more difficult. Absolutely. Um, we've got time for one more question, uh, Professor Leach, before we say goodbye. And that is, if someone wanted to work in public health, what's the best way to get started? Well, the first thing to say is that public health is everybody's job. So you don't have to work in public health. It's everybody's mm -hmm. job. So the best way to help with public health is to eat well, exercise more and tell all your pals to do the same. So some of the <laughs> schools watching are maybe doing the Daily Mile. That's a fantastic way to think about public health, but also... Eat, eat less chips and more bananas. It doesn't have to be chips and bananas, but whatever it whatever it is that your uh, your guilty pleasure is, and eat more fruit and vegetables, eat less red meat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all those things. But yeah. an actual career in public health, there are thousands of options. In healthcare, you you most most of the public health people are clinical, so they're either a nurse or a doctor, or I'm a dentist. There might be a physiotherapist or an occupant. So some kind of profession in the health service, and then you can branch off and do public health as you go through your training. So mm. choose a health profession and then do public health as you go through. But there's actually quite a lot of people who aren't clinical. So some of you will have seen on TV Linda Bald or Devi Sridhar as some of the mm -hmm. spokespeople on TV. They do, they're not nurses or doctors or dentists. They are scientists. So the other route is science. And if you chose to do science at college or at university, then there are multiple opportunities to then do public health. You might choose to do global public health and think about public health in Asia or Africa or even Ukraine just now. There are a lot of public health professionals trying to help mm -hmm. there. Or you might do protection and public health. So how to stop us getting the next pandemic. So science or healthcare are your two routes into public health. Absolutely. And I think we're um, particularly down the science route, we're seeing a lot of virologists um, working in public health at the moment, which is uh, quite exciting. Um, but that does bring us to the end of our live Q&A today. Professor Jason Leach, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a really wonderful chat and discussion. Uh, and thank you to absolutely everyone that has joined us uh, whether from school or at home. Um, I hope you have a really wonderful afternoon and thank you all very much. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Bye.